topic is even more personal to me um, because I've pretty much spent the past 20 years doing exactly that, uh, if, uh, even before I realized I was doing that. So um, it was a lot of up and down, and I can tell you a lot about it, but it's not me today telling the story. And I'm very happy, actually, Charlotte, and uh, swapped the role with me because she's supposed to be sitting here moderating, but because she was very busy uh, public, so I take over the role, so I can ask more questions instead of listening to myself telling the same thing over and over again. So, it's ecosystem building, and we all know how important that is. The problem is too complex, and we need like everybody to be in the room collaborate. So we need an ecosystem. So, but. What kind of ecosystem do we build, and how do we do that, and how do we measure success? And um, it is a very, very tough job, and that's why we want to have this very open conversation with three practitioners here. And uh, so, uh, as you, if you come to my session yesterday, you know that I love to uh, hear uh, personal stories, and I want to really hear how we feel about doing this type of work we do. Because at the end of the day, it is the people who are uh, making everything happen. So uh, we'll hear from these three amazing practitioners about what their view and what this ecosystem really is all about. But also, um, I'm going to ask some questions about what is most challenging for you personally to hang on there. Right, so I'll start with Charlotte, and Charlotte is the founder of uh, Charlotte, let me try the name, Charlotte Hoshman. Yes. Very good. Thank you. Charlotte is the founder of uh, Wow Lab, and uh, she's also initiated projects uh, like the uh, Wucht and uh, uh, Place Network. Um, and uh, actually, I found out Charlotte is sharing the same number, um, membership in the Responsible Leadership Network. Uh, with me, so, um, so she has been doing quite a lot of work in the space of connecting uh, people coming from very different backgrounds, like refugee, immigrants, and really bringing the wisdom from uh, these youths um, to reimagine Europe. Um, really inspiring work out there. And uh, then we have Mikal Anna. <laughs> And um, so Mika Mikala is innovation manager in ecosystem and ecosystem of Valoria University of Fine Sciences is in Finland. And uh, so he's also the author of the ecosystem playbook. No, not really, but I collaborate okay, with okay. organizations that fit this. And you tell us more about it. Yeah. And welcome Mikal and Ina. Um, I was just in your workshop and I really love it. And Ina, Ina Chilik. She is uh, uh, working at this moment as a system change facilitator and sense making lead and climate kick. She's a really, really, um, I would say, um, one of my, my uh, most aspiring organizations based in Europe and dealing with the climate change. And trying to do a lot of amazing stuff. Um, so um, I'm going to just start with you. Um, question I just mentioned. Um, how do you actually define the ecosystem that you're working on? And also, what is the your role in building that ecosystem? And, uh, and what is the approach, this approach, this whole ecosystem building approach 
particularly important for you personally and the work you do. Me, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank you, Ian. Um, so we do pretty hands-on work, so I'm here to talk about that. Um, the ecosystem building part of what we do, so with mostly with Wow Labs, which is the innovation studio that creates then different projects, of which place on migration, for example. The approach that we take uh, for creating any of these uh, projects, which are always collaborative and cross-sectorial and uh, based on a wicked problem um, of some sort. The ecosystem approach is really at the core because there's no way that we can actually do this work without building a space, uh, a platform for the different actors to work together differently than they are used to working. Um, so that's also my personal role within the, the organizations and the projects that I build. That's the part that I really love. So it's actually uh, think about what space needs to be created for different parties that are not used to working together. Many times that are not even used to thinking about that challenge. Uh, what does that space needs to look like, feel like? Um, what is everyone's role in it? What are the, what are the rules of the game? The, the ones that are verbal and, and articulated and the ones that are maybe a bit more subtle, but that need to be also owned uh, in how people interact and in, in sharing power. Uh, so that's how I think of, of um, the ecosystem, the ecosystems that I create for each project. Um, I learned this work from having collaborated with the Obama administration uh, from 2011 onwards. I was lucky to um, be drawn into that work directly with, you know, very close collaborators, the, the White House, which were actually doing really experimental work on it. I was really surprised to see that it wasn't, you know, I'm not a political person, but they were really ready to take risks and kind of seeing from community organizing approaches, what works, what doesn't, what do we do differently? And that's been incredibly formative. Uh, I think a lot of what I do now is derived from how I felt as a, as a young woman evolving and learning in that space. And then, of course, it's, it's changed. It's not only copy and paste. Um, but we specialize in VUCA situations, so volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity, which means that we're comfortable create, trying to create these platforms uh, in contexts where there is political instability or economic um, challenges or inequality in civil society that means that there's, there's something to be done in terms of creating safe spaces. Um, so it is experimental work. And one of the parts that I love most is about, again, creating the space for the different stakeholders in the projects uh, to work together. Because any of these situations, we need the different parties to be there. We would never, for example, just go with the government or just go with a company or just go with the university into a situation that's complex. We really think that we need um, the different powers and competences and viewpoints. Uh, so ecosystem in practice is, shows up in that way uh, in my work um, in different geographies. So we don't have a particular uh, geography. We worked a lot in, in Asia, uh, in Europe around migration, in the US, uh, do a lot of work in Morocco at present. So interestingly, these are ingredients for me, variables, but they are completely agnostic in terms of culture or identity. And that's also what I, what I find so fascinating to, to not placate models, <laughs> but to look for ingredients and then cook differently in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm very interested in that acronyms, the acronyms you're mentioning. Uh, we're coming to the second one question. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Um, Maybe I'll start with the question that has been lingering with me for a long time. So um, uh, I've been working a lot with starting different types of communities and, and uh, keeping those alive. Uh, I, I'm active in systems in Finland. Currently, we're trying to take the systems practice forward in Finland uh, and, and building, you know, the, 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 so there are only our individual people talking about stuff, not, not much, much is happening, but we're trying to build, you know, the, the 
communicating and showing what is what people are actually doing in this field. So I've been doing stuff like this related to different topics for a long time. And then, uh, on, so that's my those are my hobbies. And uh, and then on the professional side, I've been working on uh, um, uh, design and experimentation and innovation uh, and and. What I've noticed there is that, well, there's a lot of buzz and we bring together these different stakeholders and we have a lot of fun. We have those postings and then we come up with great ideas and nothing actually changes. So uh, I've been shifting, shifting my focus to create, how do we create the conditions that would support, you know, co-creation and, and so, uh, and other things feel a bit better. And, um, and uh, that's basically what I'm doing, doing for work nowadays. So I'm trying to uh, look at the different things that are happening in this space uh, all over the world and uh, trying to, you know, somehow synthesize the know-how know uh, that is uh, within the different type of pra practitioners who are working with uh, or, uh, different organizations so that I might be help, able to help <laughs> different organizations to build their orchestration capabilities, build their facilitation capabilities that might help uh, build new ecosystems that are somehow purposeful. Mm -hmm. So if I hear it correctly, your role is more about capacity building. Um, and uh, Charlotte's role is more about place creation, space creation, and space um, holding mm -hmm. in a way. What about you? But I have to add that yeah. it's not only capacity building because we don't yet know what, what should be done, so we have to develop the, the knowledge, <laughs> the knowledge, knowledge creation. Really, really essential. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I guess it's a mix of both. Okay. Um, because well, well, let let's start with the so climate kick has been an organization working for <coughs> creating the spaces and orchestrating the system of change um, for climate mitigation and adaptation. And of course, it's quite a big and huge, wicked problem and huge task that we can't tackle. So ecosystem building is embedded in everything that we do. Um, and uh, initially it started as um, yeah, creating an ecosystem of different uh, alert, learning partnerships and also like uh, entrepreneurs that work in the area. Um, and now it has evolved and grown into something quite morphing that we don't understand yet, uh, but we're playing with it uh, for a long time. Um, seeing what works and what does it mean to create an ecosystem for um, systems innovation in climate and how can we create those spaces for um, knowledge exchange because there's so many great initiatives out there and so many companies and organizations that work towards tackling climate change one way or another and a lot of work is done in silos and that's really uh, frustrating because um, there's so much that we can learn from each other and with each other. And uh, by creating this directionality, um, that we could, um, yeah, hopefully, hopefully progress a little bit faster and accelerate this transformation that we all push for. Um, yeah, that's something that we do. So yes, it is creating the spaces. Uh, for the organizations who are interested in working climate, but also capacity building. How can we support the organizations and, and create the space or ecosystem to um, adapt and learn with each other? And, and, and yeah, knowledge sharing is, and learning is really important. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Nina. That leads to me um, to my next question. I'm, I'm always very curious because um, I have built. Um, uh, co-working spaces in China, I actually wrote a book about it, and, and then joined some big organization, try to build something from within. But something really puzzled me is that um, uh, who is actually responsible uh, for such orchestration work? Mm -hmm. and, uh, um, and as orchestrator, how do you actually drive all these different interests and different parties together and to, to have that kind of uh, collaboration happen? Um, yeah, that's a really great question. Um, so how we started in the beginning, we were funded by uh, EIT, which is a body of the European Union, so it was a little bit more of a sort of top-down approach, okay, this is what we're trying to do, 
come work with us, play with us, let's see what we can learn. And now we're shifting into a different approach and learning of how can we actually, and of course, like that level is great and it creates a certain uh, way of engagement and different organizations come in. Uh, but because there was also like Climate Kick was a funder, so we would fund these opportunities, it creates those power dynamics, which we're all are aware of and can bring some um, distorted, let's call it this way, a relationship in, in, in the system. Um, now we're really trying to experiment with a sort of bottom up um, kind of approach and um, create an ecosystem and create that well, so called community model, we call it this way, uh, for organizations to come and co create with us um, different ways of engaging together. And we have created certain pillars that are sort of our starting points, which include like connect and how we can connect with each other better, uh, policy, how can we influence collectively changes in the policy level in different uh, um, parts of Europe that we work with, funding, mm -hmm. how we can create spaces or, and, and harness better different funding opportunities, maybe create consortiums together to apply for different European funds and et cetera. And last but not least is the space for insight and uh, learning. And this is something that I'm quite passionate about. Um, and um, yeah, how we can exchange different tools and methods and ways how we uh, work with our uh, challenge owners, clients, uh, to see what actually works in which context and, and build up on that. Mm -hmm. And show up some back to the ingredient question. What have ingredients do you use to cook this this feast mm. for everybody to be part of? Um, some of the 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 lessons I think I've learned along the way on this topic is that um, the the invitation or the convening or the the way in. To this, to this new system for most actors who, who decide to, to go on a project like that, that is by definition complex, um, really needs to be completely personalized to where that structure is in the system at the moment. Um, and I think that I enjoy the work more now that <laughs> I take this approach of really meeting people, people, organizations, where they are in relationship to the question um especially if you're working on delicate questions like migration or um because there isn't it takes away a sense of, of right or wrong or of or of some people you know know more and some people know less on the topic um or some organizations are more advanced what's become clear for me is that uh everybody when when creating an ecosystem if you can create one in in facilitating or trying to form one, um, everybody, every, every organization is going to join for their own reason. And the intention doesn't even need to be the same. And that's been incredibly liberating for me. So it's not about getting everyone to agree. Um, and that because that's incredibly draining. And to be honest, it's impossible. Sometimes it's structurally impossible to say a, a, an industry player or, or an academic or university to agree on some topics is impossible. So what do you do? Do you just not form a table with them? to act, that's really a shame. So it's more, for me, it's really about trying to meet where the different ingredients of the different organizations that might form the beginning of an ecosystem on a topic, where they are and really try and understand why it is historically that they have shown up on this topic and you end up having a conversation with a person because in the end an organization is always a person that you have in front of you at that precise moment. What led to that moment? You know, and it can be it can be a, a brand that goes through different leadership styles or, or histories. Uh, it can be a, a government that has a certain reason for taking. It's it's always complex. It's never simple. But the fact of not having to um, of, of just looking for something that they will get out of the equation, out of the result of the work, um, for me is one of the key approaches that makes this work. Uh, um, doable and, and effective. Uh, so in practice, for example, um, a project that we did a, 
a few years ago in Malaysia, in, in the north of the country, uh, where there, are, there is a, a strict uh, traditional culture, um, the aim was to stimulate civil society and especially young people um, to come up with new ideas, new products, new services, but also new ideas, right? And we were prompted or invited to do that through the Obama administration. And it was some kind of, in a way, soft diplomacy, right? They have interests, obviously, in having, uh, in a way, moderate, uh, innovation-friendly bits of civil society in different countries, because that's where, you know, this is one of them. Uh, but in some countries, it's more difficult to have to have these types of spaces. Uh, so we were brought in to kind of say, what can you do to, to do that? And the way that um, that we did, knowing that we hate being the flown in people, I think as most, most of us here, we don't really believe in that model, was to just look and see what was there. And the result, of course, the actors are not us. You know, again, we're, we're not the ones who can make that happen, but it was really about just convening a space where the different ingredients would be there for, for years to, to create that capacity to innovate from people who were usually not in a, in a position to innovate. They were the ones receiving the cultural norms and the rules of, of, uh, of society. So in practice, what we did there, for example, was from having uh, uh, the, uh, a foreign government somewhere in the equation, but completely invisible because that was their style, they didn't want to be stated, um, of course, get in the, the public sector, so the government, the region, which was very um, keen to stimulate entrepreneurship and the economy uh, because it was a traditionally entrepreneurial mindset uh, for that region, and that was their price. So they had an interest in identifying with that entrepreneurial culture. We brought in a university, which is actually where we physically created the physical spaces for, for these uh, for this work uh, on three different campuses, universities being for us in that context the most open space to both communities, rural communities that were just outside the campus. There was safe space for companies because academia is kind of uh, always going around uh, the R and D that happens in universities. And the government, you know, it was a public university. So it's all, always a, you know around looking for the common ground. And then we brought in the industries, so the the big uh, corporate players uh, who needed the result of the idea. So they needed new, just new products and new new start, new startups, basically, to incubate and to grow and to, why not buy. Uh, the students, of course, wanted to be more in touch with the international world and, and to be able to express themselves on ideas that were not. So this is just an example of everybody came for a completely different reason. Really, there was no agreement of why this was a good idea. And we didn't even have that conversation. Uh, but somehow we had the, the key people that we needed, both you know the CEOs in, in the industries, uh, the region or the government, and everybody kind of felt that they were driving it, <laughs> um, which is fine, which is absolutely fine as long as you know. Uh, then it's just a question of, in a way, engineering the space so that you know the power, the power can belong to, to different players who need to feel like they own the power. That's, mm -hmm. that's not a problem for me. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that story. <laughs> uh, and really make me uh, remind me about my own experience of being hired by a UNDP flight to Mongolia where I've never been, mm -hmm. doing exactly just that. Mm -hmm. And so I know that kind of challenge you face. Mm -hmm. You're seeing as uh, somebody being part of troops in the country to solve their problem, but um, you actually turn it completely around to identify where it will be Kind of safe space for everybody to get, to get together and start a conversation and own that conversation as well. Mm. Yeah, really appreciate that. Yeah. Because. Yeah, maybe I take a more meta meta comment on this topic, but I think it's really interesting. I've, I've been following the systems change uh, field for, for a few years now. And when I started, uh, it was very much focused on, you know, the individual capacities. So, so um, there were cool, really cool uh, programs like the Forum for the Future uh, School of Systems Change, where, where people were going to learn uh, individual uh, capacities. So, so what can I do to, you know, uh, create systems change? And they were learning, learning all the methods that are related to that. And what I'm seeing, like, in the last years um, that is happening is that uh, we are finding maybe a new level to this type of thing. So, um, 
uh, which is the level of creating the relationships between institutions, the relationships between or organizations. And uh, I think like an understanding of both what, what are the capacities of individuals, uh, what, what do we need to do to be able to act systemically? And at the same time, what are, what are the structures that are needed for uh, us as individuals and our organizations to act, act uh, systemically? I think, I think that's what's going on uh, right now. And that, that's where you know this ecosystem discussion, the discussion on portfolios that we've been having increasingly, increasingly and, and, uh, and so forth is, uh, is an example of, uh, and, and, and if, if like uh, methods and uh, capacity building that has been going on for a long time. I think this is the new thing that is emerging, and we are having these uh, first first um, uh, established practitioners and also organizations like Cora and uh, and uh, kind of and UNDP who are really starting to build their cap capabilities in this. So it's not just individuals doing this, but it's organi organizational <coughs> to to uh, actually operate in these ways. And I think that's that's really interesting. Mm, thank you for. Adding that um, to this discussion, and now I'm going to actually go a little bit more personal because um, Charlotte's a story that you triggered me. Um, I feel like uh, the type of work we do um, as an ecosystem builder or a place builder or uh, a knowledge uh, creator are often uh, quite mis misunderstood um, and unappreciated, and, and sometimes even disrespected. Um, do you, I, I mean, that's how I feel, and, but I'm still here, <laughs> and all of you are still here, so is there anything that, that you can share with us, and, you know, is there a moment that you feel like this is too hard, it's too challenging, and what actually keep you still going, and what motivate you, and mm. what is your drive? Should I start? Um, for sure, of course, there are moments, I think, for all of us. Um, I think it's really about the learning that, so the learning mindset, really. I mean, it can be a buzzword, but it, I think we all know what it feels as well. <laughs> when that, the most important thing in a, in a situation is just the learning that we're getting out of it. Um, so on, on the learning mindset, I think what's, what struck me as well with time, and that does relate to, to my own relationship to learning as well, but is that I think I used to expect uh, people in, in, in an ecosystem, typically in a consortium or in, in different parts of the puzzle that you're gathering, to learn certain things. You're like, okay, you know, objectively there's this situation where there are these nuggets that are coming out, right? The wisdom that's coming out from, from the actors in the room, from the situation. And I used to get really frustrated because I felt that these learnings were not integrated in the structure. So governments were not evolving fast enough. The companies didn't really see the point of some of the things that for me were really emerging. You know, how do you share the knowledge? How do you actually make that a new reality? Not that the transforms the organizations, which is the whole point of an ecosystem, that everyone is transformed by, by what's happening. Um, and again, I think that the relationship to learning is completely personal for people and for organizations. So even if you do have learnings on sometimes really exciting things for me, you know, something comes out of a situation that's like, wow, we just didn't know that. You know, we had a few hypotheses. Look at what's happening. And then you can have different organizations, different um, capacities in the situation that are not taking that, that are not just seeing it. They're not evolving as fast as they could on that topic. That used to cause a lot of frustration for me. Um, and I think that now I'm, I'm similarly to the point of entrance or the convening. Uh, I'm like, you know, what, whatever works for you. Again, you show up in a situation as an organization or as a person because, you know, that's happened. That, that's, it took you there. Whatever happened before took you there. And you can only do as much learning as, you, as you're ready for, as you want, as you can cope with. Uh, and on, on wicked problems, the learning can be pretty intense, as all of you know. Like it can be, can be bam in your face all of a sudden. It can, uh, it's not a gentle process. At least for me, it's never a gentle process, the, the learning from the experiments. Um, so being centered on my own learning is a way that, that I keep the joy in what I do uh, and not try and stuff down the, the knowledge from the experiments to everyone who's taking part in them. Um, 
and enjoy the the way, enjoy the process of. So even if an actor seems for me pretty um, late at the game in a way on the topic. I've learned to, to develop more enjoyment from the process of them learning and developing some complexity of thought or of reaction to a topic that is new to them, mm. rather than be frustrated uh, with latecomers and, and pioneers in a way. Mm. Uh, and that's the way that that's the way that I can really get super enthralled in a in a in a conversation with mm. someone who's from a completely different standpoint on the topic. But what unites us is the learning. Mm, yeah. Actually, one key word I've really come out of your story is patience. I'm not very good at it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, because um, actually, I, talked, I spoke to Amelia yesterday, uh, and so uh, we, we actually work together on the UNDP project in Mongolia. And so uh, our COVID people who were invited to the cluster were very busy individuals. And they, you know, and we have to move online and all of a sudden because of COVID. And then we see the government official who is really doing his best to be there are talking on two phones at the same time while attending our Zoom learning session. <laughs> and uh, the policy of Amelia is she just keep on smiling. <laughs> And I was like, oh my gosh, you know, um, I, I, I can really understand these people. They want to be part of the change, but they also have so many obligations. And there's only a little, a little they can do, but they want to be part of it. So this intense is already enough. And so I hear from you as well, this, this kind of deep understanding on a human level. And to have that kind of patience, to hold the space, for them to explore and you know, to have that kind of growth stage. And they, they, they determine their own how they actually help us in the world. And I'd like to add a point on this is that the, I'm, I'm not a very patient person as most people will tell you, but I think that the way I deal with this need for both is that the action for me doesn't depend on their learning. So that's really important as well. Mm -hmm. In a thing like that, the action it's depends nice paradox. on your team and it depends on, on what you do with the situation, right? So the learning, is a byproduct of, of the project in a yeah. way. Yeah. But my project is not that they learn. Yeah. That's just one of the things that happens in the ecosystem. Otherwise, I think I would go crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the, the kind of creative work and, and emergence of new solutions is independent of the learning. Yeah. 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 Uh, otherwise, it's impossible to keep, I think, any kind of passion or creativity in this work, Yeah. at least for me. Yes, let's talk to where it goes. You know, you want to share next? Yeah, I'm happy to. Like, I, I strongly resonate with um, the case that we um, have. I want to draw a spotlight in a slightly different area, um, but it's also interconnected and related to what you were working for. Um, one of the biggest frustrations specifically for me personally, but also what we noticed with kind of kick as organization and ecosystem builder, uh, was the very extractive mindset of uh, most of the uh, people who are engaged in this work. Oh, I'm saying that and my whole body is like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and just this recognition that a lot of us, like, and, and that like, I can tell it about myself as well. We come to different communities, to different spaces, conferences with the question, what can I get from this space? What am I gonna take from this? What are the connections that I'm gonna make? And I'm like, what is it in there for me? And that's great, and that's understandable. And yet it is so deeply supporting that paradigm shift that we're all talking about. And that's another paradox. Um, and it's really hard to operate in this space. Like, like really, I sometimes just cry because like, I, I like, we, sorry. We all are so good with our words and, and talking the talk. But when it comes to our own actions, 
we're, we're still supporting this destructive mindset. Uh, in the way we relate to each other, in the way we engage with our clients, with our challenge over partners, everything. It's, it's about like... And, and what I wish to see more of is change from this mindset to heart set. And instead of taking your all in, to, to come to a place and, and a space and a community and say, what am I here to give? What can this community benefit from? How can I contribute to this space? How can I co-create with others, really co-create the reality and the present and, and the future in a way that is benefiting not just me, but the collective? How do I shift from individual I into the collective, whatever that collective means. And of course, it's all context specific and it's all very different based on people in the room. But what does it even mean? Who are we as a group right now in this space? Yeah. yeah I can continue with that. Thank you, the sharing. Yeah. I can, I can continue with that. So now we're, what we're, you are you're, uh, referring to is that yeah, we have the mental models that are part of the systems thinking iceberg. And, and uh, there's, we have a lot to do you know, in shifting those. I think uh, traditionally, like, like that's one of those in the talk, talk, talks about deep, deep structures or, or whatever. So those are the, you know, really um, in, invisible assumptions that are behind our you know school systems and our, and our economic systems and our social systems and and um, yeah I think I think that's like um, uh, one of the one of the uh, most important uh, leverage points that we should be we should be tackling uh, I think uh, the, one of the most uh, inspiring um, um, fields uh, where where um, that I've, I've looked into in the last years is, is called vertical development. So vertical development. Uh, so so uh, in, in education and in work, we are becoming we're better. We are usually assessed when we assess how so that we are better when we you know know new topics or or uh, perform better in our own tasks. And vertical development it takes a, a, a very different stance to you know collaboration. So it starts looking at. Rather than you know how how much you can control others and how much you can uh, affect by yourself, the whole point of vertical development is to you know um, create the mindsets and the practices that enable people to collaborate with other more people and support other people. So it turns the hierarchy to a growth growth hierarchy where where uh, your um, your um, abilities and your your um, your, your capacities are assessed based on how many more people you can, you know, uh, um, um, inspire to, you know, embrace the uncertainty and self-organize and co-create and you know, stuff like that. And that's like, uh, uh, I think that's that's a huge, you know, leverage point we should be tackling in society. That we should start building the, the vertical development capacity of our individuals. We should have training programs for for individuals in this this area, not just take people to go to uh, learn new things in a training program but rather you know develop their capacity to collaborate mm -hmm. and and it should be part of our organizational practices so we don't have rigid processes where one process owner tells everybody else what to do but actually it's co-creation where we can bring in everybody's information and uh, you've, been, you've been working on a lot so it's it's uh, it's a lot of a lot of things like this is that uh, it's completely missing from our you know Way how we develop people, how we develop our organizations, and so forth. Speaking of hard set, um, when I actually was involved in this whole chaotic work building the system, the most annoying question I got, actually most annoying question for me is, how do you measure the impact? <laughs> What is the success? Actually, a better question would be how does the success look like? But you know, when you're trying to 
uh, approach funders and they will usually ask you like really hard like cool me measurements and so I will always try to tell them how the success looked like but it seems like this this like a nothing translation just, I could never really crack that um, I know there are different kind of methodologies and, and tools and process and uh, metrics and that are emerging um, to help us to have that kind of uh, conversation with people who really wanted to put resource and uh, energy in. And how do you deal with that? And this is the last question I asked uh, before the closing, and I'm, I'm going to invite the audience to ask questions. Please be prepared. Uh, for me, the question of impact is very very alive also because in the last few days we've had amazing conversations uh, about it uh, and I love Anna Bernie yesterday describing impact as a kind of you know I think I'm never going to be able to say the word impact in the same way again uh, but that kind of captures it as well right it, it's still a very in a way of an, an extractive <laughs> mentality um, and yet of course it's needed like like funds or or like cash generation or like HR, so many of these things, right, that that are, uh, that have a dark side are, of course, the engine and we, we will still need them tomorrow to build, to build all these projects. So impact is a very interesting conversation because for me at the moment, there really is no uh, comfort zone from people who are in this space, from the practitioners towards it. So that makes it very, very alive and very interesting. Nobody has clarity. We know how we feel. Obviously, the indicators and the tools that you that you uh, mention, uh, we use them. Uh, of course, uh, we spend a lot of time. You know, the teams producing these things, and yet we know that it's not really the core of the question. That what we do is, of course, uh, a, a bigger gamble uh, than what we can measure in, in you know twelve months, five years, ten years with the present indicators, which which are too simple. So I think, I mean, quite simply, the complexity of what systems change sets out to do uh, hasn't found um, the complexity in, in measuring what it produces. And that's fine. That's a moment in history. Maybe we will produce that collectively. But it's very, very, it's a felt uh, experience for anybody carrying a project right now, but that's not the case. So there are two conversations. There's a conversation of how you reassure people that, again, people and organizations that you take with you on, on a on the journey to complexity uh, in practice, and then how do you make sense of what you're doing, and how do you even know that it's worth yourself going there or taking other people? Um, I think it's a matter of finding your space and that discomfort. One way that we deal with it in practice for us in, in the in the project teams is that we create hypotheses um, that are much bigger than impact indicators mm -hmm. yeah. that are really for us. They're for the team and they're for everyone to you know uh, co-create about what what is it that we're trying to find out what are the things that we are hoping uh can emerge not of course in shape but in in value i guess is it, is it shareable are, are you willing to share so some of them interestingly we've actually experimented with sharing some of these hypotheses and the learnings in things like annual reports or project reports which are of course very limited now in their scope um I never asked actually what some of the people who are obsessed about impact measurement or indicators think about those few pages, you know. Um, but it, I think, yeah, I mean, they didn't say, you know, what is this? But maybe they didn't read them because they, they're a whole other world, right? As we know, how you think about what's happening in the ecosystem and how the different things will transform each other completely different from having a set of indicators with, you know, qualitative and quantitative and yeah. testimonials. So for us, it's having a double conversation, uh, hypotheses on one side, which, which is much more welcoming of complexity and actually thrive, thrives on complexity, mm -hmm. and indicators which looks for simplicity. Um, and that's kind of a happy marriage as well, I guess. So everybody does their thing. Thank you. You know, Climate Cakes has been around for 10 years. I mean, this kind of question they have to answer. I'm sure they have something that we can all learn from yeah. and um, uh, are something that uh, you can also imagine to evolve in the future. 
Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. <laughs> we have so much to improve with that, that's for sure. And there's a lot to learn. Um, like, but yeah, this basic question, like how do you even measure the simulation mm -hmm. that we're building here, right? Uh, right now, I have to say, we have a new team, which is a monitoring and evaluation team, and they're actually looking at that from different perspectives, how we can sort of synthesize different learnings from the experiment that we've run for the past 10 years. Uh, there will be an impact report coming in hopefully very soon uh, that will give a little bit of a glimpse. Uh, but also like what we also recognize that the sometimes quantitative um, KPIs and measures are not enough because we are talking about change of the mindset. And this is not something you can easily measure. And what it's been, has been helpful for us is to to like have this general goal. Yes, we want to um, sort of hold the community, uh, which would act as a living system mm -hmm. that would be adaptable, that would uh, self-organize, uh, distribute resources, uh, and etc., cetera, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But in order to get there we need some milestones and stepping stones that would help us. So we, we sort of splitting it into different stages, I guess, I don't know what's, what's the proper word for it. And, and we're looking how we can get to that vision uh, with, with the smaller steps, because even if we introduced this concept, and we did with our community model uh, from the very beginning, there were no takings in that stuff from this because nobody knows, like how, yeah. We need to build the capacity to participate and collaborate and really engage so people see that they also have the agency in co creating their spaces. And that's not something that we can measure with just numbers. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, going back to the ecosystems uh, discussion, so if we're, we're uh, looking at the impact of ecosystems, uh, that is. There's this organization called uh, Strive Together in the U.S. They've been doing a collection Strive, to Strive Together. So they're they're working on you know building partnerships related to children, bettering children's life and the opportunities of children. And uh, the they have really great uh, theory theory of change, but uh, the way they show their impact is through partnerships. So they're measuring how many partnerships do we have, you know, in the you know early life of children, and how many partnerships do we have in school and, and so forth and they have different topics that these partnerships are focused on so i think that's really really interesting so interesting way and that also shows us that you can take very different part, uh, perspectives into evaluating impact so you can look at, look at it from the project level and say that maybe this has some impact but usually projects don't have any any significant impact then you can look at it that, from a portfolio level, which can take a longer perspective, quick perspective of time, and, and we can look at, but and there, there was one of the writers in the social evolution of social innovation book where they're looking at really, really long time spans and uh, looking at how, for example, national parks came to be in the US. It wasn't, you know, one decision by government, it was, you know, a number of decades and a lot of, you know, innovations, a lot of uh, government. Uh, uh, um, activities, a lot of you know citizen active, active activities that is going on, and uh, that's actually probably how change happens. So it takes a few decades, and you can't control it. It's many different parties coming together, and uh, and probably something happening in the in the environment that it creates creates the need for something new. So uh, it's very difficult to to measure it, uh, and at the same time we're always asked that what well. But this project that you're working on, what is it impact then? <laughs> this, uh, whatever you're working on, what's the impact of this? And uh, I think we should somehow be able to broaden, broaden the perspective and look also not just what uh, one funders funds are doing, but also what the other funders of the uh, ecosystems next to this one that we're working on are, are, are uh, doing so that we can say that, okay, all of these ecosystems are you know, creating the conditions systems change. Thank you. Can I just add one point? Uh, I think that hearing you, it makes me think one of the issues I think is that the impact conversation is really at organizational level and none of us are there as organizations. I mean that, that's not where the interest is. We're there, the interest lies in the system 
and the impact conversation is always initiated on what did that player do what did you so you're it's a, you know there's no way of getting out of the kind of egotistical view of an organization which is literally diametrically opposed to what we try to do in the rest of our work which is not to uh, you know, pull the blanket and, and focus on only finite resources of one organization. You're constantly trying to see beyond that. Yeah. yeah. So that actually connects the loop to what frustrates you the most, the egocentric sort of approach. Because at the end of the day, you have to show your founders how your performance goes. <laughs> so uh, that, that actually is a systemic problem as well. So yes. Questions. Okay, and what is your take on uh, the impact conversation? Uh, I'm kind of one of Shelby from the Future Food Institute, and we call ourselves the ecosystem. We don't know after this conversation if we truly are. Um, and we're um, experimenting with this tool called the Three Impact Tool by Tim Strassen, who you already know about that, which measures and which reflects on the depth, uh, width, and the length. Uh, the impact that you gain. So it's one thing, one narrative we found to be uh, stronger than numbers mm -hmm. in each context. So my question was more uh, more practical on the how is it? What kind of skills do you think uh, ecosystem builders need? Uh, are you born as one? Uh, can you learn those skills? Uh, what kind of team do you need? Yeah. yeah. Because the timing just made one skill. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> Each one of you. That's like impact. <laughs> yes. How many people do you need? I don't think you're born as anything, to be honest. That's my very personal belief. Um, if I had to choose one, it would probably be listening. But that wouldn't be enough alone. But I think that's. Yeah, that's the base. One okay. Thank you. We're gonna get two more. <laughs> <laughs> mm, like, like from this vertical development perspective, it, it, the basis is you know how we develop from children to adults and what happens in our adults' life. Uh, um, taking this uh, systemic uh, view to leadership, for example, that I'm not leading you for you to create success for me, but I'm leading you to, you know, for you, um, to empower you guys to um, to um, 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 uh, create more success that we can make together rather than, you know, uh, what, I, what, what, what I can do uh, through you. Um, that's a very late um, uh, developmental stage uh, for, for people. Um, but uh, in terms of like what, what practices are right out there. I think facilitation, coaching, and uh, on the inter-organizational level, orchestration. If you look into those disciplines, then you can start, you know, building your mindsets uh, regarding regarding um, um, how to, you know, create these situations where you are not using your power over others, but you are creating situations where others can use power with each other <laughs> and you are facilitating those processes. I would argue that it's a quite adaptive because there are certain kind of process that we do need to step out and leave that process. And then once things start to merge, then you go back to your lessening chair, right? I'm, I'm very grateful. <clears throat> you named a very important and I was like, okay, which one do I choose? I'm <laughs> glad that I have the name. So I can just add a little cherry on top. Um, collective transformation and really engaging in, in, in that process and discovering as a group how do we see the reality that we're part of, not from the individual, but really that concept. But this, what's the skill you actually, well, facilitate that? It is selective sense making in the practice. Um, so, yes, it, it's a process. Uh, yes, you need facilitators to hold it, but it's something that once people um, start practicing, they can do it for themselves. And, and it's, a, it's a skill, it's a muscle that we can all build uh, um, on, on different levels. Yeah. I found the question that you asked in the previous episode is excellent, excellent question. It actually completely changed you know, the blaming, shaming mode into a co-creating mode. So yeah, I really appreciate that. Uh, process. Yeah. 
what I'm hearing in this uh, mini part of this event is this interesting shift between personal transformation, agenda, and language, and then organizational things, which are both critical for system change. And then I'm looking like, do we need more inclusive language for personal transformation that onboards maybe more pragmatic kind of point of views? And this was, for example, a very concrete idea I had. For example, grief is an experience. You experience when it happens to you. But then when you tell somebody who didn't go through that, to do your job, you need to know what grief is. And that person is, I don't know, it didn't happen to me. Suddenly, that language might be very not, not inclusive at all. So how can we jump over that bridge? Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts? I feel like you already answered your own question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I would say, who hasn't gone through grieving? Like this? Raise your hand. I think it's a very collective theme there. Yeah. But I, I'm curious about what you think. Maybe it's a bad example. I mean, mm -hmm. not everybody is into self transformation yeah. as much as some others. So, yeah. how do we build bridges between these? Yeah. I mean, my, my reflex to your, your line of inquiry is which I definitely share. How do many of the really important concepts that are showing up in some networks or some circles? How do they become much more shared? And for me, it's a question of, again, who owns the conversation? Uh, so it will always be artificial to try and translate. It's really about slowly, and again, this is systems change, it's not something we can control, but making sure that conversations are much more shared. And that's something we can do you know, at a personal level, at, a, at a, an organizational level, of really making sure that people who are most dissimilar to each other as possible, uh, sharing conversations that you are having. And I think it's true uh, at the level that uh, even at a, at a family or friendly level, uh, as an organizational level, like to, for us to, to be, to do some of the uh, emotional labor of transforming maybe slightly these conversations so that more people can find sense in them. And then the more people, you know, slowly, the more people invest in these conversations because they find their own words and their own concepts and their own resonance. And then I think that hopefully that, that problem or that tension will disappear. The problem is that many of the concepts are appearing in very, very non-diverse circles. Yeah. So then there's this question of kind of who will translate, you know, which is a, a very strange problem to have. The question is that the people, you know, that there's no diversity in, uh, it's not only language, it's, it's. Yeah, I love your question. I love your question because I think we kind of have a misperception that so when we bring different players together, we tend to call them government, business, but they're actually human. They're, they're people, they have feelings. And when somebody resists to a certain change, there is a, whole emotion, emotional baggage behind it. And do we really have the patience or the room and the space for them to express it? Yeah, enough. I was just going to add to that, but yes, yes, to both of you. And um, the thing is that language is so limiting. And, and like what, even if we say the same word, sometimes the concept behind it is different. And yes, it is important to get to the space of common language and common understanding, and another layer to it is embodiment. Mm -hmm. How do you show up as a systems innovator? What does it mean to you to just carry with your being this concept? Not what you're saying and what you're expressing and how to share those, but like how do you show up? And people feel it. And then they become curious, and then they ask you the questions, and then you can engage in interesting conversations and get yourself in a space of answering the question that you never thought that existed. Thank you. One last question. <coughs> Just a, a little yeah. contribution to the things about a few days ago, or a few weeks ago, I found the inner development goals. 
which yeah. I hadn't heard mentioned yet, but actually listen yeah. is the first one. And I think they're very, very, I'm sorry, I haven't delved into the details, but I think many of these questions are on vertical developments and stuff. Like those IDGs, I think, should be part of everything else. They are, how do we be from all of this? Yeah. They're worth investigating again. Yeah. That's <coughs> I can I can do that because that's exactly an example of the vertical development skills that I was, mm -hmm. I was mentioning. That. And yeah, it's, it's a pretty good science. Uh, Behind behind that, so so the uh, inner development goals or the you know some people call them meta skills. They are skills we need to be able to collaborate with each other as peers. And this, so some examples of those are like conflict re conflict resolution or <coughs> dealing with conflicts. If you are you're tired, you're angry, you shout. If you're a very very advanced person, you are able to you know. Uh, empathize with others and help others. Others empathize with each other, and and uh, there, there's like a lot of skills like that that the in, in, uh, inner development goals are trying to uh, synthesize and uh, tapping into those and teaching them to us to probably make humanity a better place in terms of being able to relate to each other. Yeah. And please take them with a grain of salt. <laughs> because again, they, it's a little bit tricky because they're inner development goals. They again put the focus into us as individuals. And yes, sometimes it is important to look at yourself, but what we're talking about is a relational aspect, right? And how can we see ourselves in each other? And how can others see themselves in us? And that component is is important. And it's not just about inner development. It's Okay. And they are Western centers as well. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you, Ina, Mikael, Charlotte. Thank you for opening your mind. <laughs> Thank you, audience, for being very, holding that space for this.